This is a follow-up video on how important mitochondria are in our health and that's because of how important the role of mitochondria is inside our body. Basically, the idea is, is that mitochondria act as miniature mini computer processors in our body that processes information and then that can be collected from the entire body and then it gives output its own specific output that can also influence the entire body so check out the introductory video where i talked about what kind of information mitochondria can process and there's lots of it and um, today we're, we'll talk about how mitochondria do it in order to achieve this amazing computer-like capabilities in, inside our body. My name is Dr. Mikhail Rashik of Merogenomics, and let's begin. Just a quick warning, I'm going uphill, so there might be some huffing and puffing. <laughs> so in the original video, I focused on the, on the images in, the, in this awesome review, which by the way was sent to me by one of the Patreon members. There's a lot of interest right now, in the mitochondria because of the video series I did that discussed the th uh, theory that mitochondria that cancers could be happening because of metabolic problems and that's basically metabolic problems because of malfunctioning mitochondria hence the interest in mitochondria right now so check out those series this is why my why I started paying attention a lot more and I will be continuing making videos on mitochondria and related to this, to this theory as well. And basically, I wanted to continue showing these figures from that paper. So I'm going to jump right into it. And basically, we're going to be talking about how, does, how do mitochondria integrate this information and what do they do? They're very plastic organelles, meaning they have a lot of capacity to change their behavior in different ways as a way of processing information. And there's this great figure that shows this. And basically we're going to go one by one. So what can do mitochondria do as an outcome of obtaining input from the body? And remember, this can be from the entire body, not just its own immediate environment. So number one, but mitochondria, and remember, mitochondria are very important for producing energy for our body. That's what they're most famous for. And that's what these authors are arguing. Well, we're underappreciating their importance. They're doing so much more than that. But number one, mitochondria can fuse together. So you can bring two mitochondria and put them into one. Or they can also undergo fission, basically, when they can break apart into smaller units. Okay. Now, what's interesting is, is that there seems to be that when there's metabolic abundance, that's when mitochondria are undergoing fusion. So this is when they will join together. This means when they have a lot of chemical sources to process, they can fuse. And if there's starvation of these chemicals, they, that fusion process can be inhibited. Now, what's also interesting, remember, why are we interested is because of cancers. What's also interesting is that it cancers, it, se it seems that fusion is more frequent than in healthy cells. So keep that in mind. That's, I thought that was, that was interesting. Next one in line, mitochondria can form what is referred to as intramitochondrial junctions. That's, this is really cool. Mitochondria can come together and touch each other. When they touch each other, they form these junctions there. And what's really interesting, remember mitochondria have, obviously they have outer membrane, right? Like a shell, if you will, but they also have a membrane inside and that membrane can fold many times over. And those folds are called Christie's. And what's really interesting is that Christie's from one mitochondria can continue and form the formation of Christie's in another mitochondria through those very intramitochondrial junctions. And this is especially evident when you exercise. So I thought that was really interesting. Now, why does that do that? Because this is what helps mitochondria send information from one mitochondria to another very efficiently. Of course, when you exercise, you're telling mitochondria to process certain information. Obviously, you need more energy output and you breathing more oxygen. You need that oxygen for this chemical process called oxidative phosphorylation, which is the, the biggest output for energy production. Okay, so I thought that was really cool. 
next one is mitochondria can form tunnels, nanotunnels. So when, and this ha especially happens when the movement of mitochondria is restricted. And we'll talk about that in a, in a second right away. And, excuse me. <laughs> and basically, when they cannot move, for example, in, in, in uh, cardiac cells, which requires a lot of mitochondria because you need a lot of, a lot of energy, they might not have the same capacity to move around. So they can send these tunnels quite long distances to send information in between one another. However, if I recall correctly, the, the authors also mention that these tunnels are more frequently observed in cancer cells as well. All right, next one after that was a, basically a process of diffusion. So what are we talking about? Obviously, mitochondria can release different signals or chemicals straight out into its own environment. Remember, the immediate environment of mitochondria is liquid, right? It's called cytoplasm. That's the liquid inside the cell. And, and whatever mitochondria will release, it can diffuse like a gradient uh, away from mitochondria to start communicating with whatever is in vicinity. And some of the examples is reactive oxygen species that mitochondria can produce, and they can use that as a signal in order to communicate and send information. Or another one is apoptotic signals. So remember, apop apoptosis is a, is a program, specific type of program cell death. Check out the original video where I give a little bit of background on that. And, and I'll be talking about a lot more on this concept as well when I make videos on autophagy, so stay tuned for that. And, and uh, that will also diffuse. And uh, so that's an example. One after that is the actual movement of mitochondria. So mitochondria can move around the cells. And the way it happens is that inside your cell, there's a skeleton. And just like we have a skeleton, your cells will have skeleton as well. It's called cytoskeleton. It's made out of different types of proteins and the cytoskeleton can act like a highway inside the cells. And many things can move along that cytoskeleton from one location to another. And so can mitochondria. And mitochondria can move from one location to another. This, by the way, is needed for that fusion process. So you need typically, ideally you want one stationary mitochondria and you want, you want one moving mitochondria to bump into the stationary one. And that's the most likely way of succeeding with forcing that fusion process. But also mitochondria can move around the cell and when they see information that they, is important for them to process, for example, they find sugar molecules, they can stop in place and start processing this. And remember, we we're discussing those cancer videos that the theory that cancer is a metabolic disease and therefore it's absolutely dependent, cancer is absolutely dependent on sugar and uh, glutamate. I hope I said that right. Anyway, uh, we're going to move forward. So that was uh, the movement. And last one is, of course, interaction with other organelles. We discussed in the previous introductory video how mitochondria is a especially well known for interacting with the nucleus. We'll talk about that in a second right away. But another example is, for example, we mentioned that mitochondria are important for processing steroid hormones, right? So this is a good example how interaction with organelles is important because, for example, mitochondria will obtain cholesterol, unprocessed cholesterol from, say, fatty droplets that are in somewhere in the vicinity it will start processing it inside a mitochondria. Then this has to be sent to another organelle. Organelles are basically tiny little like factories inside your cell. They do different purposes. Nucleus is, a, is an organelle, Mit mitochondria is an organelle. It will send it to another organelle. I believe it's called in the plasmic reticulum, but this is from memory. So I hope I got that right. That organelle will then process the cholesterol further and then send it back to mitochondria for final processing and then finally you get your steroid hormones right so it shows you how how the proximity of mitochondria to different organelles can influence these processes right and uh and it's very dynamic all right uh, so that's basically 
shows you what mitochondria can do as a consequence of processing variety of information that can be obtained from the body, right? Now, next one, in figure B of that, of that figure, they basically bring up this concept that mitochondria network is very similar to, you can think of like our brain network. So they, the authors of that review, they bring up a few concepts. So let me tell you about it. So number one, mitochondria mimic neurons in that like neurons, they can process a lot of different information before the final output is put out, which can also vary in the, in the degree of, say, intensity or uh, what the output is. So mitochondria can process a lot of information and it's not unlike neuronal cells. So vagus nerve is a perfect example of that because vagus nerve processes information from literally all over your body. And it's these nuances of information from different areas of the body that determines what the final signal to the brain is being sent. And also, check out the big series that I've been working on on the vagus nerve and how wildly important vagus nerve is for our health and benefit to our health as well. All right, moving forward, another one is similar to the brain. Single mitochondria is not powerful enough, but it's the assembly of many mitochondria that actually give it a power. And this is similar to assembly of neurons inside the brain. So that and then final concept is that just like in brain, this assembly can form distinct structures that can have that can have unique functions or purposes. So this so you can think of mitochondria inside our body like a form and how it is, excuse me, and how it is distributed throughout the cell and how different cells have that distribution. You can think of this as a form of a primitive brain. I thought that was a really interesting concept that they're introducing, the authors are introducing uh, for us as well. All right, then in the last section of that figure, they talked about how this uh, networking can also be influenced and it's influenced by uh, factors. Obviously, number one is the size of how many mitochondria are contributing to this. So different, different environmental factors can influence how many mitochondria are being present. Obviously, exercise will, will force your body to, to have more mitochondria. For example, that's one of the benefits of exercise. Next one is how connected these mitochondria are between themselves with for communication with one another, okay? And then, uh, that, so I already explained that in detail. And then the next concept is what they refer to as modularity. So what do we mean by that? And this is another very interesting point is that one mitochondria does not equal to another. Mitochondria are not the same, even though all mitochondria come from your mom in, in the fertilized egg, but as, of course, as you develop, these mitochondria attain their own specific subtypes in different cell types. So as an example, and they're called uh, mitotypes, <laughs> cute name. So as an example, your heart mitochondria will be specialized to produce a lot of ATP because your heart is an engine that never stops. Well, never say never, you know what I mean? <laughs> never stops throughout your lifespan. And, uh, and therefore, it always needs that energy in order to work. So your heart muscles are highly, mitochondria are highly specialized to produce a lot of ATP, those energy molecules. Check out the first video on the series for a bit of a background on that. All right, so that's one example. But not only are different organs have different, say, mitotypes, different types of mitochondria, even adjacent cells can have wildly different functioning mitochondria and it gets even better even within a cell in different areas of the cells you can also have different types of mitochondria as well so really what they do will determine also the health of the of the cell which will translate to the health of the organ which will then translate to the health of the body so that's that one and the last concept is how these mitochondria are arranged in a three-dimensional space 
within a cell and this is a very dynamic process for example specific inputs can lead for mitochondria to assemble closer to the nucleus where it can start influencing it more profoundly than if it's further away and that brings me to the last image of the paper so let's discuss that really quick and in figure a they show we basically they summarize the paper how mitochondria you see this mitochondria in three different colors I think it was like green blue and, and red and, and you have an image of like a, micro, a computer processor inside and the concept here is that that's what mitochondria do they take in information process it and then that determines the output that can influence the health of the entire body and so right so that's the summary image but it's the next one that is very cool in figure b you see a bunch of cells with those colorful mitochondria highlighted inside the cell so you see that that's very cool and then you see this giant yellow blob and that's basically the nucleus okay and uh, dotted red lines mark the cell boundaries uh, from between one cell to another all right so then we zoom in into the proximity of that nucleus and you see how mitochondria can be in very close proximity to the nucleus you see in the nucleus there are what is referred to as pores openings inside the envelope of the nucleus this is how information can go in and out of nucleus makes sense they have to have openings and mitochondria can send signals they can go inside the nucleus very rapidly depending on the proximity of mitochondria to the nucleus and start influencing the genetics of how the genetics of that nucleus is used so i mentioned that in a previous episode we mentioned how powerful mitochondria are in influencing epigenetics that's basically your lifestyle influence on how your genes are being used and then also how genes are used directly as well because of the signals that mitochondria can be sending to the nucleus again we talked about that in the first video so check that in this series so check that out as well i just thought this is a cool image that you can see this so and then and then they finally they they, they summarize basically the how the this dynamic behavior and complex behavior of mitochondria of be, being able to put in take in that information very diverse information from from the body and again check out the first video to see how many different sources of information mitochondria can process and the outputs are equally complicated and therefore it can start influencing our health and this is why overall why i made this video to start helping persuading you and myself in this concept how mitochondria could indeed influence our health including something as dramatic as cancer and the author summarized the paper they, they said look uh, it was really neat they thought that perhaps acquisition of mitochondria by cells might have been the big important evolutionary event that has in the end allowed development of such complex or complex organisms as what we now see on our planet that's how important the mitochondria are all right so i'm gonna end it right there one more thing that i want to tell you i want to mention about my patreon account because um, i changed the format of how my patreon works basically if you want to become a patron I want you to know that all videos are now pre-screened or Patreon first before they come out on YouTube and then paid members get to vote which videos should come out on YouTube. Now some videos are for free, any self-help help, self -help videos will always be available for free no matter what, including on Patreon. You can also become a Patreon member for free so you can check that out and there's other content available for free on Patreon so please check that out and uh, please uh, help me support support me uh, that way help me out that way if it's of interest to you because uh, this way it's not just financial support it's also collective brain support in terms of determining what content should be produced and more and more of my content is now indeed driven through the variety of suggestions of my patron members all right so that's it and I want to look forward to seeing you in another video installment in a great, beautiful outdoors. And bye for now, everyone. Ciao.